Hello and welcome to the podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name's George Miller, and in this program I'm talking to Edward Castleton, who's a historian and co-author of a book in French on the mid-19th century history of socialism. In a recent issue of Le Monde Diplomatique, available at mondiplo.com, Edward examines the current state of progressive politics in the US through the lens of the country's historical experience of socialism. In 1906, sociologist Werner Sombart published his classic study, Why is there no socialism in the United States? Was it true then? And is it true now? And can progressives expand their base sufficiently to pose a serious challenge to Trump in 2020? We'll come back to those questions. But when I spoke to Edward on the phone recently, I started by asking him if being based in France gave him a different perspective on US politics. Perhaps. I mean, I'm a specialist of the 19th century uh, French socialist and anarchist history, notably the ideas associated with Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. And so I'm used to actually thinking about what socialism might have been at its beginnings before the 20th century and before the Soviet experiment and when there were many, many diverse currents of opinion, thinking about uh, questions like how best to organize the divisional labor to resolve the problems posed by social inequality and so forth. And certainly those traditions that you find prevalent, not just in France or Francophone Europe, but throughout Europe, and even to a lesser extent in Britain, have been something which have been largely historically absent as a dominant political or social force in the United States, certainly in the 19th century, perhaps to a lesser extent in the early 20th century. So I guess that does put me in a position where I'm constantly confronted by the differences in available political options which one finds in Europe as opposed to in America. And I guess a lot of us are familiar with a a certain kind of American exceptionalism when it comes, well, in in many regards, but also in the in the the regard that you're talking about the the apparent absence of socialism when you begin to look at that as a as a historian where do you sort of identify some of the the, the roots of that exceptionalism or perceived exceptionalism well the debate about american exceptionalism is really something which is which is launched by a european observer of the United States, a German contemporary of Max Weber named Werner Sombart in the early 20th century. In 1906, he wrote an essay, Why Why Is There No Socialism in the United States? When he tried to think about why there weren't the same political conflicts that you found in Europe, where you have social democratic parties, which flourish, really prominent trade unions and so forth. And this sort of sparked subsequently uh, a kind of literature thinking about the differences between European and American politics and uh, the various ideological currents available to people. Sombart's ideas were really developed in the post-war era by an American um, political scientist who was also became a sort of neoconservative intellectual named Seymour Martin Lipset, who then wrote a number of books uh, trying to thinking about these differences between American politics and European politics. Also, what distinguished even the United States political life from Canada's Canadian political life. So this, this discussion about exceptionalism sort of is a, is a longstanding one. And various factors have been given to explain why is it that America is different from Europe. I mean, one of the things explaining why there's there supposedly was no socialism in the United States. Was there was you have in it mass immigration? You have a very heterogeneous working class. You have cultural differences, which are a result of this society based in large part by the influx of uh, labor coming from abroad, uh, which kind of prevents class solidarity. You also have a constitutional system which isn't necessarily conducive to um, having a plurality of political opinion. 
also you have everything sort of associated with being American, which is part of being American is you can, anyone can come to the United States and have a better life. So you have these values of upward mobility, of sort of starting over again, which again, militate against developing forms of class solidarity in which upward mobility, which is inherently in a way individualistic, would not be necessarily a primary social value. Something which will stick in my memory from your article is the um, the idea from the historian Richard Hofstadter, who said that instead of having ideologies, the U.S. was its own ideology. Which I guess is what you're what you're really sort of saying. This this notion of the American dream means that people are are constantly sort of looking upwards economically and perhaps not not worrying too much about being you know, forming class solidarity and um, uh, and embracing socialism. Well, it does make you think that everyone does protest a bit too much when you go and when you travel in the United States and you leave a, any major city and you see the kind of plethora of American flags flying in every single house. I mean, you wonder, is it possibly real that these people are so patriotic? Do they really think the United States is that great that they have to put the flag out in front of their house? I mean, that's, that's, you don't see that anywhere else, I think, in the entire world. But you do, it's true that you do have this. I think that you have this less now, though, than you might have in the past. I mean, even the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag is something which is fairly recent, uh, linked to sort of the entire American imperial project uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So this reverence for the flag and this ideological conviction and what it means to be American might be more recent than we sometimes think. Certainly it's post the American Civil War in the mid 19th century. But that what Hofstadter says is, is there is some truth to that, I think. I think what you see going on now, and I think that the success of Bernie Sanders in a way within the Democratic Party and the way that that has evolved, even the way younger people think about socialism in a lot of recent polls I, I mentioned in my article, shows that maybe people are not so convinced that the United States is the greatest nation on earth with its own special manifest destiny and that everyone else should be imitating this kind of American model of high levels of uh, social inequality combined with the virtues of uh, free speech and some political liberalism in a pay-as-you-go political system. Uh, So I think that what's going on now is in a way people are starting to call into question a lot of these beliefs which became really culturally dominant, I'd say, during the Cold War. In a way, maybe this is glasnost for the United States on some level. (laughs) There are so many levels of US politics. I wanted to ask you, where, where do you look to see socialism at its most active, its most potent, its most engaged, its most promising, you know, from, from, the, from the upper echelons all the way to the grassroots? Where, where, where are the signs that the political context is, is changing? Well, I think, first of all, is there such a thing as socialism in itself? I mean, there, there have always been many, many different currents of belief that could be kind of classified under the socialist tradition. So when people talk about socialism now, they're really talking about social democracy, as, uh, which they associate with, with Bernie Sanders and some of these young congresswomen who have been elected recently, which I think is a salutary thing. But the larger question is, to me, to what extent are people's attitudes towards uh, forms of state intervention in the economy and long-held bromides and traditional beliefs of economic liberalism being called into question. And I think since the 1980s, you had this sort of rightward turn, not just with Reagan, who was president during that era, and then followed by Bush the elder, but also even within the Democratic Party, which became much more right-wing or moved to the right. And I think emblematic of this also was the Clinton administration's two terms in the 1990s, when a lot of things like attitudes towards unions or attitudes towards free trade agreements changed. And I think what you see going on now is sort of a calling into question of that, not just among more progressive Democrats, but in the way the success of Trump, uh, 
is also built on this calling into question of a lot of economically liberal nostrums about free trade, for instance, and protectionism and so forth. And also the, Amer- the larger American imperial project, which in a way, Trump distinguished himself from his fellow Republicans uh, in being very critical of, even though now that he's been in office, he hasn't done very much about that. So how significant was Bernie Sanders getting down to the final two in the previous Democratic presidential race? Well, I think Sanders' uh, campaign, uh, perhaps in the, in the last election, was, was even more significant than this one, insofar as it really represented a challenge from within the Democratic Party to the kind of Clinton establishment, which had been in power for a long time. It also really changed the way I think people thought about progressive politics. I mean, for the longest time, I'd say since the 80s, when you had maybe the Jesse Jackson campaigns, the, if you really were sincerely left-wing, you identified with left-wing politics, progressive politics, you voted for somebody like Ralph Nader, who was an independent candidate. You voted Green or... Perhaps if you were really dissatisfied with the political parties and you weren't necessarily a leftist, you voted for Ross Perot. But in the case of Sanders, he showed that you could also run from within the Democratic Party and challenge the Democratic Party. I mean, in a way, this is perhaps logical, because now that you have a, since the Citizens United Supreme Court decision, you really have to have a lot of money to bankroll a presidential campaign, and anyway, bankroll any kind of campaign for that matter. It's always been the way, that way in the United States, but it's certainly gotten worse. In the primary system, you do there is some room for ideological diversity. However, it's perhaps the only moment in an American presidential election when you have that level of diversity. And then once you get to the presidential election, once you get moved past the primaries, then you get more sort of everyone moves more to the center. And I think Sanders really took on the Clintons. And I mean, in a way, they excluded him too, which made people even more disgusted with Hillary Clinton, no doubt costing her a number of crucial votes too. And I think what Sanders proved is you don't necessarily have to run as an outsider. Now, Sanders is a, is a longtime admirer of Eugene Debs, who was uh, one of the founders of the American Socialist Party, which had some success in the early 20th century, and Debs himself ran for president a number of times between 1900 and 1920, more or less. But Debs always ran as an outsider, as somebody who was uh, not running within the Democratic Party uh, or the Republican Party or any establishment party. And what Sanders did was he actually ran from within the Democratic Party. Now, you can hate the Democratic Party, you can love it, but what he did do is he forced establishment Democrats to have to take issues on things like health care and college tuition uh, and a number of other economic issues, uh, which before the Democrats had studiously avoided. Both Hillary Clinton, when she tried to push through health care reform, never considered the single payer option, and nor did Obama when he pushed through health care reform more successfully. And I think that a lot of exasperation uh, that you find in the United States with the Democratic Party establishment for being a bunch of centrists who don't really represent anything or any beliefs apart from their own possibilities of election or re-election crystallized around centers. And that's been fairly salutary for getting a greater diversity of belief within the anti-Republican opposition. What effect do you think the phenomenon of Donald Trump is having, will be having, on the expression of progressive agendas in US politics? Well, one of the unfortunate things about Trump is that, uh, and perhaps it's analogous to Brexit in Britain, is that he's such a polarizing individual that he manages to get people who represent a very diverse set of opinions to rally together. You have the, uh, the establishment, the foreign policy establishment, the political establishment in the United States, which hate Trump. 
The media hates Trump, the established media. Wealthier, educated people hate Trump for oftentimes very good reasons. The racism, the sexism, the vulgarity, and so forth. On the other hand, these people represent the establishment. They represent the top 5 10%, 15% of earners in the United States. And these same people are oftentimes pretend to represent the interest of everybody else. That means the 85 to 80% of people who don't make as much money as the establishment and the elite who hate Trump. And the question is, can you really, if you're interested in socialism and you're interested in redistribution and you're interested in seeing maybe greater levels of equality in American society, can you really form alliance with the establishment uh, without there being conflict? Now, I think that the Sanders-Clinton conflicts of the last presidential election were evidence of this. Now, this sort of establishment is pushing people like Joe Biden or Kamala Harris Buttigieg, or however you pronounce his name officially. (laughs) And they're trying to push these people because Sanders is seen seen as threatening. Warren, perhaps a little bit less so, but, you know, she does represent the kind of anti-monopoly tradition within uh, American politics. You have people like Tulsi Gabbard, who represent more the kind of isolationist currents within uh, what the available political options are within the primaries. This this is all very threatening to the establishment. However, the establishment knows that people like Sanders have a great deal of grassroots support. There are people who are are willing to go out there and campaign for him and who really feel pretty passionately about these questions like health care, which is a huge problem in the United States. And so it's what we'll see what happens. It's unclear because uh, can you make a devil's bargain with the elite and the establishment. I don't know. I really don't know. It's unclear. And uh, it's also Trump himself. I mean, who would have thought that he would have even been elected yes. president in the first place? Yes. And so, made it to the end of one term, let alone run for a second. I think that if the Democratic Party puts up a centrist candidate like Biden or Harris, I'm not sure that they're going to find themselves, you know, replacing Trump come election day. But uh We'll see. Uh, it's too, perhaps too soon to tell. What, what I think that is interesting about this debate about socialism and how Americans are starting to sort of reevaluate socialism, having been for a long time since, let's say, the Cold War, really since 1945 until maybe the 1990s, until this century even, having been systematically anti-communist, anti-socialist, generally speaking, as a majority of public opinion. I think what's interesting is that, in a way, if you go back to the Sombert thesis, Sombert believed that one of the reasons why there wasn't socialism and why people actually believed that they could improve their lives by moving to the United States was that they actually could. In other words, that upward mobility was real on some level, Whereas it isn't anymore in the United States. In a way, why would a European of any nationality want to leave Europe to move to the United States? They're not going to be better off unless they're super rich and they can pay less taxes or something like that. I don't see why anyone would want to do that. So in a way, the the Sombra thesis, even as people are starting to reevaluate positively, socialism or whatever socialism might mean because they're projecting whatever their desires are onto the term has not been disproven by this sort of reevaluation because in a way now that their inequality is largely entrenched in American society people are starting to think well maybe maybe it's time to think differently about about the redistribution of wealth and how we can improve American society and so I, I think that that itself is also kind of an interesting question. And at the same time, people are calling into question, you know, economic liberalism. And they're also on the right calling into question things like immigration and so forth. So in a way, the discussions of the of these these sort of seemingly arcane academic discussions of political scientists from, you know, the in the, from the 20th century 
do still have some pertinence in so far as they allow us to think about how things might have changed in the way we see or perceive American politics and its possibilities. Well, Edward, let me add, let me ask you in conclusion that really the question that you pose at the end of your piece in, in Le Monde Diplomatique, you write about a left-wing activism that has its base essentially among young, educated, middle-class people. And right. you, you ask whether it will be possible to expand that base, that agenda of, of political radicalism, to other socioeconomic groups, including those, or some of those, who at the moment are tempted by the, the Trumpian worldview? I, I don't have an answer to the question. That's why I asked it. I, it's, it's not obvious. I mean, on some level, the Bernie Sanders campaign success in the pre- previous primaries, so not the current ones, it was based on not just this question of having a more European style healthcare system, single payer, whatever, but also on having a free college education or having tuition rates for universities significantly reduced. Now, obviously, this whole issue of university tuition rates, that's a, those are kind of middle class, upper middle class concerns. And if you look at, for instance, a, a very successful left wing publication like the Jacobin, in the United States. I mean, it's sort of the epicenter is Brooklyn, right? Now, real estate in Brooklyn now is more expensive than even in Manhattan. So we're not talking about socialism from the time of Debs, which wasn't necessarily exclusively in New York. It was present in all sorts of strange, unlikely places in the Midwest and in places like Wisconsin, but even in the Southwest, for the same reason that populism, too, you know, was very successful. And the American populist tradition, which I haven't talked about yet, but, you know, it was, was also kind of going on at the same time, a little bit mm. before the American socialism, socialist movement, was present in the 19th century in the South and Midwest. And it was the coasts, in a way, which were always kind of the bastions of the establishment, in a way, the same way that they're the bastions of the anti-Trumpian establishment now. So then you have this question, which people invariably ask in the media, you know, well, what about the white working class? Is it the white working class intrinsically racist? And is it going to be just rallying to Trump forever because of this discourse of protectionism and protecting industry from China and and so forth? I don't have an answer to that question. And I'm not sure if if white lower class people, uh, working class people are inherently, intrinsically racist. I don't believe that. You would think, listening to people uh, in the media sometimes in America, that that is the case. So will these people from Brooklyn and from the coast, from the Bay Area and Northern California, are they going to be able to go out and and talk to people in the South, in the Midwest, uh, in these bastions of Trump support, which are critical to overthrowing the Republican establishment and stranglehold on the Electoral College? I don't know. I hope that they're able to do it. But there is this class tension which does manifest itself. But then on the other hand, you know, if you look at people like uh, Sombart himself or uh, Karl Marx or, or many, many socialists in the past, they weren't necessarily uneducated proles. So this question is the is sort of an enigma, but I'm willing to believe uh, that if if people make the effort to communicate with people outside of their class comfort zone, that some progress can be made, and that there people don't intrinsically have the beliefs they have because of the class that they're born into. People yes. can change. So I don't, I don't have an answer to your question, but I think that this question will see how things play out and whether or not there could be socialists in not exclusively in metropolitan areas like, you know, New York. I was talking to Edward Castleton about his article, Socialism is No Longer a Dirty Word in America, which originally appeared in the July 2019 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. It's available on the website, 
at mondeeply.com. If you're a subscriber, you can read every edition of the paper, going back over 20 years, as well as exploring other resources, such as maps, images, the podcast archive, and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of content online to entice you to become one, and full details on how to go about it. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world, behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.